Thank you for the uh, introduction. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to come here again. This is my fourth time, definitely. I'm thinking maybe the fifth time, but I was here in the very first uh, 30 people room when we were thinking about what's, what's needed. It was very refreshing to see the way this has grown. You really can't ask for more, and the kind of discussions and so on has been great. Uh, I am with the City College of New York. I'm with the director of the Earth Engineering Center, and I put this up because what I'm going to show you uh, from our research, obviously from students that we work with, but we have a worldwide collaboration, uh, some that are here and, and others that, that aren't, that we've sort of drawn from and really leverage, and, and, this, is, and this is the key. And uh, my charge today was maybe to give some thoughts and some prompts for discussion, and hopefully we will. Uh, I'm from New York, so are there any other New Yorkers here? Usually there's two of us, so th we got one great, because right, one of us has to get out of here alive to <laughs> report back what happened when the other one doesn't make it. Uh, so, uh, so I may be the one that doesn't make it, because I'm going to try to get you to think. Um, I may not have a summary, because uh, I think we sort of know at this point really what the main points are. I want us to start thinking about something. There is uh, a hierarchy out there, reduce, reuse, and recycle, recover, we can insert things, anaerobic digestion, composting, and we could really parse it. Uh, the problem uh, starts right at the top with reduce, and that's a signal to us that says we're the problem, you and me and these great guys here. Why? Well, first, I want to put something into perspective. This is waste generation rate, kilograms per person per day, low income, low middle income, upper, in, upper middle income, and high income. And what you generally see on the averages is that as income goes up in a region, country, or person, that their waste generation rate goes up. That's what this shows. And that would be the trend line. That would be the trend line through the average. If we keep that trend line through the average, and we open up all the data where those averages come from, it looks more like this. So there's the trend line of the average that we just saw of those bars, and here are the four bars. Now we're sort of looking at the resolution of the data where all of that information comes from, and what we see is that that trend line actually represents the data at about 7%. So this gets us to think, it got us to think over at the Earth Engineering Center. And here we're looking across, you know, $100,000 in terms of um, income. If you take those averages and you do a statistical analysis on it, you see a little something different. Here are those same low, middle, upper, and upper income. And now we see the statistics on that, and we don't quite see that, that trend. But what I think we do see is a band that gets generated. And the band of garbage that you and I generate and the world generates falls fairly narrow. Let's just, for a simple number, say two to five pounds per person per day. And this goes over an order of magnitude in terms of income. And so what we see is that perhaps there's a lower bound this is what we pay attention to. If we want to reduce, the question is, how far can reduction really get us? And is there, it brings up a question, is there a certain amount of waste that must be generated to sustain lifestyles that span from, and we could push this back, I got this for clarity, but it gets a little bit more noisy when you go back to you know zero dollars and, and five thousand dollars. Do we need to produce a certain amount of waste from 10,000 all the way to $100,000 of our standard of living? And it gets to the point of the presentation that we just heard that what the heck does sustainability mean for someone at $10,000 income a year to somebody at $100,000 income per year, but both seem to have a floor of two pounds per person per day. So this is one thought. This is why I may not have a summary, because these are not necessarily random thoughts, but I will try to tie it together. Understanding the food waste. So we have a very big collaboration with the Department of Sanitation in New York, and what I can say is, for all of the detrimental uh, and usually true things that are said about New York City, uh, the Department of Sanitation is actually doing a tremendous job. I did not know that 
until I got involved in some projects with them, and I went back and did the research. First, uh, they have a large number of efforts that we could discuss. I'm not going to go through it, but what we found is the Department of Sanitation in New York City wanted to put two bills in the, in the law to say combating food waste, rescuing food should be done at certain levels and there will be incentives, there will be penalties and so on. And so the question came up, well how much food can be rescued and what kind of real impact would it have? So here I don't want to go through the details, but here is what we've identified as the meal gap in New York City, 145,000 tons per year. Here's the current rescue, it's about half, and so therefore the needed rescue. So, you know, for what's being rescued, if we doubled that effort, we could feed all of the hungry people in New York City through food rescue, and this is a great thing. Nobody does not want to stop this. Nobody wants to stop this, everyone wants to do this. But what we looked at, 78,000 tons per year, the food waste generated and the edible food is you know, far in excess of what could possibly be used in a very beneficial way. So that brought up the question to the Department of Sanitation, holy cow, if this bill gets put in place and now all the food needs to be rescued, things can't be wasted and so on, the Department of Sanitation is concerned that they will now have a massive stream of food waste to deal with because it's all been concentrated and the question is, where is it gonna go? They have composters in the Newtown Creek facility that they can put it to, but this stream will far uh, exceed the capacity of those. So again, the imbalances of just making policy decisions before understanding all this data and where it all can go can have very adverse, um, adverse effects. But this just shows the scale here. This is what's needed. This is what really can be obtained. Looking at plastics, big discussion. Uh, so first, again, as we heard, do we want to go back to glass and metal? Uh, well, that has a big transportation impact. We did a study where we looked at <clears throat> total waste generation, and we're excluding yard waste for specific reasons I could get into. This is published uh, versus real uh, PCE to 2009 dollars. And we're looking at years. You can't see this here, but each dot is a year, 1960 all the way to 2011. And what we see, again, correlating back to that sort of first waste generation uh, chart that I showed you, is if you look at PCE, this is sort of a um, surrogate for, say, GDP, if you will, but it's on the consumer side, that if waste generation went up as GDP or PCE went up, it would follow the 45 degree line here. And what we see is for a long time that it is following this line. But at some point, it bends off the line. And so therefore, there's a decoupling that's occurring between MSW generation and the actual, let's say, PCE uh, uh, generation coupling rate. So what that means is something here is happening in terms of, well, GDP is going up, but somehow the waste generation rate is bending off of this. What we found was that if you look at the waste stream, all materials in the waste stream have gone up by maybe two times, three times, paper, textiles, and so on. Plastics have gone up by 80 times, nearly, nearly 100 times in this same time frame. So how is it that you could have a stream of plastics that went up a factor of 80, when all other wastes went up by a factor of, say, two, maybe three, depends on how you parse the data, yet the generation rate is now decoupled from the consumption rate. And this speaks to the ability of recycling certain things like plastic, reusing things like plastic, that can help offset what actually goes into landfills and so on. So this gets to the hierarchy. 
right? Reduce, reuse, recycle. This again is in the United States where we generate 366 million tons. This I think was 2016, maybe 2017. And again, New York City has a huge effort. They spend $1 million on one program to do direct reuse. And what does direct reuse mean? That means they incentivize Salvation Army, they incentivize Goodwill, they incentivize the citizens to give their materials. They have pop-up stations or something like this, I forget the exact name, pop-up shops that people can bring their material that, that the consumer, you and I, instead of saying, we're not gonna throw this away, we're gonna give it away, and then, of course, Department of Sanitation has to determine if anybody really wants your jeans with the holes in them, right, or your worn out shoes, and they'll figure, so they, they do all of this, and that entire effort adds up to 0.43 million tons, half a million tons in a year. Five minutes? Great, thanks. Recycling is 90 million tons, what's being done in terms of anaerobic digestion and so on, and I want to point out in the recycling, we've heard this, there's a distinction between recovery and collected for recycling. And New York City knows this, there's a big difference for that, yet the numbers look a hell of a lot better when you say we collected it for recycling and that's where it should go and as long as we send it somewhere and as far as we're concerned it's recycling, we're going to use that number. That doesn't, that first of all cons confuses the citizens. Because then in New York City, a lot of them go to college. City College has 275,000 students. They read and they find out, wait a minute, some of that material that was collected for recycling didn't even go to recycling. They don't have all the information and what then is the message that's sent? What the hell am I doing this for? That was a waste of my time. I'll just throw everything in the corner receptacle and if anybody walked around New York City, Every corner has a garbage pail, and nobody waits to get to the corners, but that's a different story. But they'll just say, I'll just frickin' throw it there. Why? Because that message has gotten confused because to conflate one number makes it look good, but yet then it demotivates. Waste to energy, what New York City will not talk about. This is the country, we do about 30, we, we do about 12%. But what New York City won't talk about is that they actually send 25% of their waste to incinerators, WTE facilities, and I'll show you a little bit of that in, in just a second. And that leaves 228 million tons. So that means if we want to really just reduce, well, if we do that calculation of two pounds per person per day, not sure how far that's gonna go down, uh, recycling, even if you have, we're collected for recycling, get rid of all of it, that's a huge gap to fill. And again, to our moderator's point, all solutions are necessary, there's not one. All are necessary. When we talk about recycling, there needs to be proper information. Again, you know, all of the work that we do, we try to publish in very technically peer-reviewed journals that uh, our colleagues come back to us and say, no, 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 you have this number off by say half a percent or three percent, yet getting the message out there is important yet it must be done in an extremely rigorous way so it can stand up to scrutiny against some of our colleagues and other experts that are trying to really understand this. And what we found, and I think you all know this, you don't need to do this, but two things. There have been real recycling rates that have been verified, not recovered for recycling, but actually recycled. And you know, in Europe, in Lombardia, Italy, we found some of the highest ones at 85%. My uh, colleague, uh, Professor Arena, can tell me exactly if that's correct, but we think we verified that. Um, and in the United States, we have a couple that hit about the 50, 60 percent mark in terms of real recycling verified. What that means is, first of all, that's not 100 percent. Second, when you just look at having an ideal recovery rate of paper and plastic, which should achieve very high recycling rates because everybody seems to be aware of it, and educated about it and wants to try to do something about it. What you're left with is 15% of a residual that even when it gets to the facility, it's a perfect stream to get recycled. The technical capability of that process cannot convert 100% of it. So you could have the perfect PET stream. 
You could have the perfect newspaper stream. You could have the perfect cardboard stream, uncontaminated because we, the consumer, finally brought it to the right receptacle at the right place and didn't mix it with anything else. And it gets to the best facilities that are then doing that job. The sheer fact of that it's a mechanical process, there's something called fines. The stuff breaks. That breakage and other things adds up to 80,000 tons, 15%. That is true end-of-life material that already went to the recycling facility. But because of the processes that we have in place, cannot capture all of that. What will we do with it? And this is the point. And then, of course, there's trade-offs in terms of performance, and we saw that. So, we have energy and materials recovery from waste. And, you know, I just kind of put here that's as received MSW. It's good to take the mass, to, to take the full mix if there's no infrastructure, no incentive, no interest in doing recycling. There are facilities that can help to manage these. And we heard from, from the previous speakers, and Professor Rainer gave us a very good rundown on chemicals and, 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 and uh, and energy and, and, and fuels from waste and energy from waste from gasification and so on. But they generally like more pure streams. So again, back to what's our behavior. Great, thanks. And you know, I point here in Canada, uh, we work very heavily with the city of Edmonton, and I point to uh, they are doing a very good job. Maybe if others know better than I do, but we work with them for about four years with Enerchem and Ed at Edmonton, and they're doing a very good job. The last thing that we have to understand is when there are things being done for recycling, for fuels production, for another product that it's going to, to supplant or to replace, how does that actually perform? And in our group, what we hear a lot about is plastics to make fuels, that's the next best thing. And we heard previously, use it again. So the plastics at their end of life, the fines that come from that recycle, take that plastic, make a fuel, and let's drop that into the fuel. We actually test that fuel. Does that perform like a real fossil fuel? Because if it doesn't, now we just had a cascading problem with something else. And so we've examined facilities that take plastic, make fuels, we put it to an engine, we test the emissions, and sometimes they're pretty good, sometimes they're worse. So these are the kind of consequences. I don't want to go through too much detail, I'm running out of time. But when we recycle things, we have to understand, if you recycle, let's just say, cadmium, for example, that it's staying in a certain stream and then it's staying in that product. If we put it through a different type of facility, a gasification facility, a combustion facility, you can capture that, but it's in a different form. But maybe now you could use that element in another product. And so this kind of gets to that sustainable material circular economy, and we have to think about, do we always want it in there, or do we want to actually remove it and put it somewhere else if we have new products and things coming through? Finally, I don't want to go through the details, but even when we dispose of things in a thermal process, we are absolutely burying a lot of the material if we're not using the ash. And there's a lot of uh, uh, issues around that. This is the data, you'll have the slides. But I like to put this up. You know, here is just in one facility in Switzerland where you have about 3,000 tons of aluminum that's in the ash. This is absolutely recoverable. This we can use again. And then finally, we should think about new things to use so we can make new products and try to really engage that circular economy, but we have to be open-minded. The key is dissemination outreach. Over at City College, we are fortunate that we have radio and television that we could say things on and reach a large audience. Um, but we need more of this, and it needs to be done in a technically informed, correct way. The last thing I want to say is back to New York City. They asked, is it possible and what would it mean if New York City disposed of their waste with all possible facilities and so on, and how could they get to zero landfill? And I just show, I could go through the details here, but I showed them Central Park, and I said, well, if we want to send it to landfill, here's how much of Central Park you're going to take up, at 25 feet deep and 25 feet high. But if you put in a thermal processing facility, I said, for example, combustion, that's the amount of space that you'll use over 30 years. I said, so this is the kind of perspective, and of course, in New York City, land is important. They're listening, and this is the point. So a lot of this we learn from conferences like this, ones that we go to, there's ones that's coming up. 
Uh, I want to thank my colleagues. I'll have to thank everybody else. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction. And uh, as a member of the organizing committee of this conference, I have to say that I'm really pleased with the number of people attending and also the, the quality of uh, what we have been listening so far. And uh, obviously, this is a tough act to follow now, but it's my turn. So uh, what I want to share with you today is uh, um, uh, something that will complement uh, what Umberto presented this morning. Uh, Umberto talked about gasification. I will talk about pyrolysis. And uh, so what I want to present to you is uh, some of the work that we do at uh, ICFAR in terms of uh, conversion of biomass residues, co-products, and waste uh, to value added products. Uh, this is our uh, institute, and uh, it's a bit of a unique place. Uh, we are uh, part of Western University, but we are not on campus. We are located about uh, 15 kilometers north of the university in a specially designed facility where we uh, are focusing on research work that uh, would interface better with the industry than uh, traditional university uh, research that is done on the benchtop. Um, among the current research areas, uh, we are focusing on research, uh, reactor technologies for the conversion of biomass and organic waste uh, through pyrolysis, waste to resources, including plastics. And, uh, and I have to say that today I will talk, uh, talk a, uh, a lot about what we have been doing more uh, over the last uh, few years, focusing more on agricultural residues and, uh, and forestry residues, but uh, well, lately we have been getting into the plastics as well. Uh, forest biorefining technologies, and surprisingly, maybe for somebody, we are working also with the petroleum industry, so we are not just uh, uh, working in the, in the area of renewables, but we are working on uh, the conversion of heavy oils in uh, fluidized bed uh, reactors uh, um, with, through the fluid coking technology. And, uh, and in fact, there is a very strong analogy between what we do with the heavy oil industry as well as what we do with the um, renewable industry, because essentially we are using the same technologies. And we are learning from one and feeding into the other. So let me tell you about pyrolysis. Uh, it's called pyrolysis in, when we talk about sustain, uh, renewables. Uh, it's called fluid coking when it's, uh, we talk about heavy oils. So pyrolysis is breaking biomass residues, co-products, and waste with thermal energy in the absence of oxygen. And Umberto mentioned that this morning. Pyrolysis is not combustion and it's not gasification, although pyrolysis is a component of those two processes. But we stop at one point. And uh, basically, it's a waste conversion technology. It's one of those that we have in the portfolio to consider when we talk about circular economy uh, to break down complex molecule structures into simpler ones. Uh, the heavy oil industry has been doing this for a long time now. They have been taking basically dirt from the Athabasca region and uh, breaking it down into simpler molecules and then reconstructing uh, components that are very valuable. So we need to do this with uh, renewables. So when we talk about <coughs> biomass pyrolysis, this is a bit the picture that we get. We take biomass, we go through the pyrolysis process at temperatures around 500 degrees Celsius, and we get 10, 20 percent gas uh, 50, 70 percent uh, liqu condensable liquids, uh, 20, 30 percent uh, solid residue called biochar. The bio oil, the condensable liquids, include an organic rich phase and an aqueous phase. And uh, that's the spectrum of products that we, ha we have to play with. Basically, we have gone through a depolymerization of the molecules of biomass. And this offers opportunities then. To, to use these structures and uh, refine them into products. And our objective is to try to get the maximum value for these products. Now, when we take plastics, the, the process is similar. When we take heavy oils, the process is similar. Anyways, the, with the waste plastics, 10, 20% gas, 
I cannot call it by oil, I call it pyrolysis oil, 50-70%, very different than the one that you get from biomass because there is, no, uh, there is uh, uh, really no water, um, and uh, carbon black. Um, this, uh, I didn't specify whether this is uh, biomass or plastics because uh, the trends are really similar for all uh, feedstocks. As a function of temperature and residence time, we get these typical trends where as you increase the temperature of the reaction, the uh, uh, amount of condensables increases and gets to a sweet spot and then it starts decreasing. Correspondingly, the uh, solid residues decrease and eventually lead to the ash level of the feedstock, and the gas progressively increases and then exponentially goes up as you get into the gasification regime. With the residence time, the shorter the residence time, the faster we, uh, we, we freeze some of the molecules during the cracking process, so we tend to maximize the liquid products. So now the, the, the question is, what do we get? Uh, it depends really on what we put into the system. And we can deal with a lot of residues, uh, uh, lots of products, uh, lots of waste, uh, lots of co-products. And this is what we have been playing for a number of years, uh, dealing with low-value feedstocks, trying to get value from them. So starting maybe from a liability, something that has a cost to dispose of, and then to get into something that would potentially have value. So we have been playing with a lot of different feedstocks and producing different liquids, different solids. In the, in the early days of pyrolysis, when I was in this university doing my PhD, we were really focusing a lot on the liquids for fuel applications. Uh, when I got into uh, this uh, in more recent years, we have been focusing both on the liquids as well as on the solids, and in fact focusing more on chemical applications because we have been looking at the economic aspects of, of the, the, entire, and the entire story. So where do we get the highest economic value from a pyrolysis, from a pyrolysis oil, from a bio-oil? It's in the pharmaceuticals maybe, or cosmetics, or flavors. Uh, food additives, um, antioxidants, pesticides. Uh, I'm talking about a number of applications that you may not have thought of that you can get from different feedstocks. But uh, in fact, our research has shown that you can get a lot of different interesting non-conventional products uh, from, uh, from uh, um, residues and uh, wastes. So for example, we have been able to extract uh, in uh, uh, very efficiently uh, pharmaceuticals of very high value, maybe um, ant uh, anti-tumoral agents from the liquids much more readily than from the original biomass in a may maybe higher concentration, uh, faster extraction, etc. Uh, flavoring, if you go to uh, food stores, you may see on the shelf what they call liquid smoke. Uh, liquid smoke is not, nothing else than bio-oil diluted in water and sold for a price that is about 10 times the cost of gasoline. So that's, these are high-value products, maybe very small markets, maybe more limited feedstocks. I wouldn't use a chicken litter for liquid smoke, but uh, some nice woods can get to that. Uh, pesticides. Uh, this, this, is, this was some exciting research that we did in, a, in collaboration with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, uh, dealing with uh, residues that uh, are coming from maybe the tobacco industry or from the coffee grounds or uh, coffee residues. You can make some interesting natural pesticides uh, that are actually very effective. One of the most challenging tests is the Colorado potato beetle. And we have been experiencing, uh, 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 we have been doing tests with 100% mortality of, uh, of the bugs uh, with uh, tobacco waste bio-oils as well as coffee ground bio-oils. But you can make uh, lots of other things uh, like foams, uh, like insulating materials, uh, resins. Um, one interesting, I mean, if you think about the lignin that is con uh, the uh, key part of biomass, when you break lignin, you form phenolic structures. Uh, 
So one of the thoughts was, well, let's take uh, these phenols or these phenolic structures, combine it with formaldehyde, and make resin. So we can start making plywood using um, wood products rather than uh, um, petroleum phenols. And, uh, and we have been doing this quite, uh, quite effectively. Uh, reaching 100% substitution of the phenol with bio-oil, with pure bio-oil, without even refining it. Um, we, can, uh, we can make uh, lots of other things, including fuels. And in fact, uh, from, uh, from bio-oils, we can go through hydro-deoxygenation uh, processes. We have to remove this oxygen, we have to remove the water, and we can get into, into fuels. Cost is a, another issue, and, uh, and this is what uh, needs to be considered. And you can burn by oil as is, as a, as a fuel without any refining, as a, as a low-grade fuel oil. We are working with the companies where we can use these bio oils as they are in engines, but also, for example, in lime kilns in the, in the um, uh, pulp and paper industry and so forth. Now, the biochar is interesting. This is an, a product that we were trying to minimize in, in the early days when I was doing my PhD because we were focusing so much on the liquids. But the biochar has value. I mean, in the early days, biochar, well, that's the way they were making it. Um, uh, all the condensables were going up in the air together with the gas. Um, but you can do a lot of things with bio, uh, biochar when you produce also bio oil to complement it. Uh, biochar is basically a carbon structure, which can be more or less porous, depending on how you do the pyrolysis process, containing the mineral material that was in the original biomass. So it's becoming a very interesting material because, uh, well, one easy application is you take that biochar and you put it in your garden and you use it as a slow-release fertilizer. You can use it as a soil amendment. Um, my 91-year-old mother has used biochar in her, with her zucchini plants, uh, showing tremendous advantage of biochar-treated uh, zucchini plants as opposed to normal zucchini plants without the biochar. But you can, uh, you can use it as a fuel, you can burn it as, uh, as we, were, we do it on the barbecue when we use charcoal. Uh, you can use it uh, as, uh, as a feed for activation, and you can activate it, increase the porosity, and all of a sudden you have activated carbon, and you can put it in your Brita filter if you want. Or you can use it for removing H2S from flue gases or mercury from a power plant or so forth. Um, if you go to, well, I don't know about Waterloo, but in Toronto there are a few pizza places where you can find, uh, you can buy pizza with biochar embedded in it. Um, and uh, the claim is that uh, pizza becomes much more digestible. I had that pizza, I tried it, and it tastes the same as the other pizza. It looks a bit darker. Um, uh, anyways, you can, if you can take biochar, you can make it into pills. You can sell it uh, for a high, high value as, uh, as a pharmaceutical additive for feed and food to control gas, for example, for digestion and so forth. Um, recent applications that we've been playing with, in, uh, with biochar is, for example, embedding it in cement and uh, for improving the acoustic attenuation of uh, maybe those panels that you can see along the highways for sound control, or you can uh, use it for um, controlling humidity in a cellar, or um, you can use it as a uh, filler for composites, and with uh, our colleagues uh, from the University of Guelph that are here, Amara, and uh, we, we have been uh, embedding it into plastic uh, uh, materials to make very light composites. I'm just going to skip this, but I'm just going to show you one of the technologies that we have been developing. Um, we go at ICFAR from, from the lab to a scale where we want to get into the commercial world. So we license this technology to Biotech FAR. Uh, this is a mobile pyrolysis technology that allows 
the user to go with the machine to where the biomass is, treat it when it's available there, and then move away and go to another place. And this opens up also the other discussion that we should all have about feedstock availability and the cost of transporting bulky feedstock uh, to a centralized plant as opposed to go to with the plant to where the feedstock is. So key questions, feedstock selection, value, and access. This is what I was leading to. How we can optimize the value of the products that we make? How can we build market confidence that these products are good and they are of value and so that uh, the market can be stable? Uh, how can we create a sustainable value chain? And the long term is uh, do this without uh, subsidies. So in order to answer these questions, we are researchers, we want to help the industry. So what we have been doing is we have been gathering the excitement of, and the interest of uh, industrial organizations and the city of London. And we have created a consortium of uh, uh, 11 uh, organizations plus uh, Western University um, to, to develop a, a program uh, which we call thermochemical conversion of biomass and waste to bioindustrial resources. Uh, this is an industrial research chair program sponsored by ANSERC and by the industrial uh, companies part of uh, the consortium, uh, linking all the elements of the value chain. So my objective was really to bring companies, organizations that are representing feedstocks, that are representing conversion technologies, and they are representing market up uptake, so that we can link all three and, and, and create the flow along the value chain. And, um, and the interest is to do research and development uh, for solutions and uh, implementing some solutions, uh, the solutions at the commercial scale. So unofficially, I can tell you that Answer has approved this program. I cannot tell you officially yet, but unofficially. Um, these are the, uh, these, this is the vision, linking the, the three big pillars of feedstock, conversion technologies, and high-value products. And I can show you the companies that are part of this. We have companies that are big, companies that are small, um, but it's interesting that, and it's exciting that we have companies in the three sectors. Now, what I want to do today is I can open an offer to those of you that are not part of this consortium. You can still join in. And uh, especially because the program has been approved now, if a, if a company wishes to join in, it's basically a way of jumping onto the bandwagon and get automatic matching from ANSERC. So um, please consider that. Among these, uh, I, I want to stress, and, uh, and Jay talked about this morning, uh, the partnership that we have developed with the City of London is very exciting because uh, this is now opening up uh, our opportunities uh, to explore more the, the waste world. And this is the same with the Canadian Plastic Industries Association, who is a partner of this. And Joe has been uh, one of the big champions behind this uh, initiative as well. So we are really excited that we are broadening up uh, the, the scope from biomass and agricultural residues and forestry residues and expanding into the waste uh, opportunities. So with this, I want to thank you and uh, happy summer. For those who don't know, the region of Peel is immediately west of Toronto, Mississauga, Brampton, Calvin are the three local municipalities. Uh, nearing 1.4 million people. We grow by about 40,000 people a year. Uh, those folks generate about a half a million tons of uh, residential garbage each year, which I get to manage. And you can see from the pictures, we've kind of got some, ex or some exciting urban areas and some quiet rural areas. Very nice place. Uh, I, I kind of welcome you all to come and visit sometime. This is just a real quick snapshot of, of what we do in Peel. Uh, 300 and some curbside houses, 900 or 90,000 uh, multi-res. We collect that with just under 200 uh, garbage trucks a day out on the street. 
And we own, uh, we own our own material recovery facility. We own our own composting facility. Uh, we own a lot of closed landfills, but no active ones. Uh, we use a lot of third party uh, service providers for our work too. Peel's diversion rate is probably not that different than the rest of the GTA. It might be a bit on the lower side or in, in the lower half of it anyway. We're running around 50%. We have the same suite of diversion programs as everybody else. Blue box participation rates are kind of in the, in the range of everybody else. What I find interesting in this, it's, it's great to see that 90% of our residents use the blue box, but when you think of it, one in 10 doesn't use the blue box. So of all the things, you know, how could people just not use the blue box? I'm looking out here, one in 10 of you probably doesn't use your blue box. A little bit worse with the green bin, and we're, we're again at, kind of at the low end, but in the, in the hunt. Um, again, about one in three to one in four people don't use the green bin. That makes a little bit more sense because it stinks, it's dirty. Uh, I hear that all the time from folks. So what we did, and I'm going to get to our, I'm going to get to our roadmap uh, in a minute. Um, Council set a, a diversion target of 75%, three hours diversion. Um, and they, they gave that to me to go out and figure out how to do it. It took about a year and a half. I worked with council quite a bit. We had our own committee. Uh, we searched all over North America to any municipality that said they had high diversion or that did have high diversion. Uh, a couple things we found. The GTA is second to none in North America. You know, Marco mentioned a few cities that are pretty good. We found Portland, Oregon uh, had some pretty good uh, programs. You get some, you know, a little niche program here and there, but overall, um, they're, they're really not doing any better. Not even San Francisco that claims, well, they don't claim, they measure according to their official measurement, 85%, uh, I think now, something like that. Uh, but they have the same programs as us and they're basically doing the same things as us. But as good as we're doing in the GTA, we could do better. This is what we see when we look in the garbage bags of our curbside customers and our multi-res customers. Almost half of the material is organic material that could go in a green bin. Uh, 15 to 20% of it, depending on which, which one you're in, is recyclable material that could go in a blue box, uh, but isn't. You know, you, you take that together, well over half of the material could go into existence. So we don't even have to start a new program to increase our, our diversion rate by a huge amount. We just have to do what we're doing a little bit better. And these, these are Peel's numbers. I've seen, uh, I've seen Durham's graphs. They're very similar. I, I would bet any municipality put their, their graphs together, they'd look similar to this. So we set off on a... On a on a journey, I guess, to develop a new long-term strategy. Uh, the target of 75% three hours diversion, that was set by council. We took the goals out of the, um, the provincial plan that, that just came out. I think it was still draft at the time. So zero waste from residential sources, zero greenhouse gas from waste activities. Those are, those are that's the end point. That's where we're gonna be, maybe where my kids take over for me or something. Uh, the reason we set those is not because we think they're achievable in the near term, but it's because we always want to know where we're going. Every decision we make has to get us closer to those goals. If it's taking us away from those goals, well, we're supposed to not make that decision and go in a different direction. The objectives, you know, pretty standard, minimize waste generation, maximize recovery of resources. We put in here design and deliver waste management services that meet the needs of our customers. Um, I, tell you, I hear every day, Jay, I'm sure you're the same. If we don't meet the needs of our customers, the phone is ringing, usually the mayor's phone, and then they call us, but uh, we hear quite a bit. So we went out, we looked across North America at all these places. We actually uh, looked at some European jurisdictions as well. And at the end of it all, we came up with a few new programs, which I'll get to in a sec. They, they had about two percentage points new policies to get at that stuff that's still in the garbage bag uh, can add about 4%. When we add, uh, when our anaerobic digestion facility comes online, we're gonna add diapers and pet waste. 
that alone adds 5% to the diversion. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the mixed waste processing at the end. Programs, textiles, carpets, mattress, furniture, those are, those are, they're straight out of the province's thing. We must have talked to the same people because we came up with the same lists. Policies, advocate for extended producer responsibility. Not, not just for the money, but I think it's important that the people designing the products are also designing the recovery system so that they, they work well together because right now, right now they don't. Uh, communications, education and outreach, we have to do a little bit better job on enforcement. One thing we heard from high diversion uh, jurisdictions is people need three things to participate well in diversion programs. They need convenience, they need education, and they need enforcement. Just think about the 401. If, if there were no police on there with their radar guns, like, nobody would be going anywhere close to 100, right? So you, you need to know that there's enforcement out there to participate well. Uh, we are going to consider a volume-based user fee. We're going to update our collection bylaw and design standards so that buildings are designed a little bit better to accommodate uh, diversion. And we're going to update metrics. I think, Dan, you mentioned a ton is a ton. It's, it's, it's not an outcome. It's just, it's just something, and it leads to kind of perverse outcomes sometimes. So we're, we're, we're talking about uh, measuring consumption. Uh, I showed you the two graphs. You know, our, our curbside folks, they do recycle a little bit more than, than our multi-res folks, but they consume a lot more. So on balance, they're probably, probably doing a worse job, just like the, the, the folks at the high end of the income scale consume a lot more. So we're going to start measuring uh, consumption. We're going to measure ourselves on capture rates more than anything else. And then, of course, we're going to measure carbon and energy, too. Uh, processing, we're uh, in the process of, of uh, developing our AD facility now. We, we're in the middle of the procurement process. Uh, yard, waste, yard waste transfer we still need and, and processing capacity composting. Uh, we're developing mixed waste and now with National Sword we're upgrading our MRF too. So the only one of those I want to talk about is mixed waste because it's the only one that's really new. We looked at some facilities in North America. We visited Edmonton. We went down the, mostly the West Coast, a couple, in, a couple in Pennsylvania, but we looked at some in Europe too. And we're convinced that although no one facility did everything we want to do, if we put the different pieces together, we're convinced that we can get recyclable material that can be sold, probably not to China, but uh, somewhere, you know, it's a little dirtier, but we can get 10% recyclable materials. We can get organics out at 35% out of the garbage, uh, probably to go to an anaerobic digestion. Low carbon fuel, uh, we've done a lot of work with the cement industry, um, and we're convinced we can get 25%. Of course, with the current government in Ontario, low carbon fuel might not have a lot of value uh, with, with the cap and trade and carbon taxes leaving, uh, you, you lose 10% moisture, 20% residue. And our, our numbers show uh, 250,000 tons of capacity is going to cost us $250 million. So I want to talk a little bit about why we do all these things. So start with why, and, and you'll see in the next few slides, I read a lot of books, and I like taking pictures of the covers and stuff like that. This book has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about, but I do like the cover. Um, so why, why are we doing all this? And I, and I hear a lot to save the planet. Really? The planet's good. It's going to be here forever, right? We can wipe ourselves out. We can kill every plant and animal on this planet. It'll keep kind of going around the sun once a year. It'll keep turning on its axis. You know, give it, give it uh, 100 million years. It'll regenerate. There'll be more people. We're not doing it to save the planet. We're doing it to save us, right? We've got to remember that. People have got to start saying that, I think. Uh, so what do we need? We need breathable air, we need drinkable water, of course we're polluting both of those faster than we should be. We need food to eat, um, we're doing a lot to destroy the, the food production areas. We need shelter, we definitely need energy. We need a healthy biosphere. So things like worms and snakes and spiders, I don't like them that much, but we need them. They're part, they're part of a healthy biosphere that keep us alive. 
And we need a civil society. We need rules, we need all the things that, that come with society. And my sense tells me that's the first one that breaks down. When we look around the world, you know, food starts becoming short, climate change starts impacting us. We start seeing civil society breaking down. So these are, these are two good books, if anybody wants to read them. Uh, Thomas Homer Dixon, he was a professor here. I think he's now at Western, or he, he was at Western anyway for a while. Sustainable material management and the circular economy. I'm not going to talk about this too much. Um, where I differ a little bit from Dan is I, I don't see these as kind of literal things that we have to follow to the T. They're, they're concepts, they're ideas. We do need sustainable material management. We're using up materials far too fast and the amount of energy it takes to use them is, is far too much so we need to become more sustainable. Uh, the state of Oregon has done some great work on sustainable material management and so has, uh, I forget the fellow's name, at uh, the University of Florida. There's some really interesting stuff and they, they get into measuring energy and uh, greenhouse gas, like carbon emissions rather than tons and stuff like that. What I do like about the, the circular economy is we've often heard, you know, you have to choose the environment or the economy. Right, if, it, if it's good for the environment, it's bad for the economy, that kind of stuff. The circular economy, it, it does kind of start to bring those two together uh, to say you can have an economy that's good for the environment. You know, we know I think recycling is seven times more jobs than disposal, things like that. The green economy in Ontario, uh, windmills and, and, and such green energy, I think it's now like a $14 billion industry in Ontario. So it's. It's growing, it's making money for a lot, of, a lot of people. I think we need some principles and, and goals and stuff like that to, to get us going in the right direction. Conservation of resources, including energy, reduction of pollution, including GHGs. We need new metrics to drive the outcomes we want. LCAs and scientific as evidence should guide decision making. And, and I say we should be looking at design for environment, not design for recyclability. Um, and that's why I put the picture of the iceberg is uh, residents tend to see very closely what happens after they've used something. They know that paper can be composted, hey that's good. You know they know that tin and aluminum are composted, that's great. They don't know what happens before it hits the store shelf. We know that 70, 80, 90 percent of the environmental impact can easily happen before it hits the store shelf when you're extracting the, the raw, uh, raw materials, the ores going to the forest, cutting trees and that sort of stuff. So we need to start looking at the whole thing and figuring out a way to get those messages out so people understand them. Which I said I was going to talk about plastics today so I, I just had to put something in. and uh, It's a bit of an enigma. Uh, you, could, you could call it Jekyll and Hyde. There's all kinds of different ways of describing plastic. Cause up until people use it, it's got the best life cycle analysis of any packaging material, right? Stuff doesn't break when it's in it, uh, less fuel, you know, less space, all kinds of stuff. And, and I think uh, there's no arguing that. It's a great material up until then. And if we were able to capture it all, it would be the material of choice, I think, for all packaging, but we're not capturing it all. And I, I don't think that a good life cycle up to the point of use can make up for letting it escape into the environment as litter. We, you know, there's a lot of talk now about marine uh, plastic in marine environments and the damage it does, and also in the terrestrial environment. So we need to solve that because it's a good product. If it was a bad product, I'd say let's just take it off the market. I don't think that's the solution. And when I say, you know, we need to figure out how to capture all that plastic at end of life. We need to figure out what to do with it too and, and the folks who scream 100% recycling I think are wrong. They have to look at the energy recovery options we talked about here uh, to, to get some laminates and stuff far better use for them. This is my last slide so I hope I'm, I'm still good here. This is, uh, I wish I could say I came up with this. Somebody showed me this once and I I can't remember who it was or, or I'd give them credit for it. They call it the catastrophe curve. Uh, catastrophe kind of hits just where it goes from horizontal to vertical. 
And when you're on the horizontal point, you can see catastrophe coming, but it always looks far enough away that you've got lots of time to deal with it. But when it hits, it comes so quickly, you can't deal with it quickly enough, and then, and then you're on the other side of the curve. So let's think about that. You know, we're seeing some things coming in the distance. They're going to get close real quick, and when they get here, they won't be able to deal with them. With that, I'll thank you. The other, other thing I would say is if anybody wants a copy of my slides or if they want to see Peel's Roadmap to a Circular Economy, send me an email. Um, I'm happy to share them with, uh, with anybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to, uh, to the organizers today for, for including me uh, on the docket. And I think it's... Uh, you know, big kudos because, you know, one of the big gaps, certainly in this industry, is the lack of communication that often happens between academia, um, the, the private sector, and government. And so these events are really, really important to help to kind of create those links and try to, you know, encourage innovation and understanding. Uh, so, so kudos to that. And just a very, very special thanks to uh, Mike Kapansky, who's, I think, in the room back there. Uh, there's very, very few people in, in industry that you can count on to sort of call and coordinate your outfits ahead of time. So, so appreciate that, Mike. Thank you. Um, so listen, I, I, I really appreciate this opportunity. That this is a really interesting discussion right now, I think, internationally uh, and here specifically in Ontario right now. Big questions around what's happening in our environments right now and how to try to find solutions in it. So certainly, again, you're seeing a lot of things happening at the EU level. Um, around circular economy uh, internationally. You've seen five of the G7 nations start to sign on to agreements on this type of stuff. Here in Ontario, we're, 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 I think there's still a goal of, of, of pushing towards more, uh, better environmental outcomes, but we're completely rethinking our cap and trade system right now. So it certainly is a, a pretty interesting uh, time in, in the sector. Um, so I'm taking a bit of a different approach than I think everybody else. Uh, you've heard from lots of really, really smart people today, engineers, uh, operators, uh, academics. Uh, I'm none of those things. So I'm taking this from a much more simple perspective. My background is more on the government politics policy type of side. Uh, so I'm probably the, the problem that uh, Dan and others have, have talked about uh, uh, today. Um, but that's the process. I'm going to take you through a much more simple, I think, interpretation of sort of where I see this, this circular economy, what, what, uh, what some of the current problems are, and understanding potentially what the path forward is. So I just want to start with a, a bit of a definition of, of, of what are we actually talking about when we talk about a sustainable economy, or again, if you don't want to use the word sustainable, whatever type of word you want to insert into that. Um, you know, and I think Dan provided a really good sort of uh, interpretation of looking at the different uh, uh, philosophies that are out there. I've tried to really dumb it down um, uh, in that side and say, really, what are we trying to achieve? Um, so if I was looking at it, we're trying to, uh, again, let's, let's take away what we're not talking about. I don't think we're talking about what type of product or what type of material you use. That's not the outcome we're looking at. You often hear these discussions about, is it plastic or is it paper? Is it, uh, is it recyclable or is it compostable? That's not what we're actually talking about. Is it a waste-based measure? No, that's not what we're talking about. We're not striving towards that 75% diversion rate or how many tons of waste you're actually diverting. We're not simply talking about life cycle uh, assessment. All of these types of things potentially fit into the conversation, but they're not on their own. It's not about simply diversion from landfill. We often get caught into this argument around, let's get all the stuff out of landfill. Well, bluntly, there's some things in there that you might want to put in a landfill because they're problematic. It's, about, it's not about recapturing uh, any type of value creation. It, it's trying to create as much value creation as possible, and it's not about any specific uh, technology per se. When I look at it, I look at it, it's a systems-based approach. We're, that's what we're trying to achieve through, a, through a, a sustainable economy. We're trying to have a system that values resource productivity and efficiency, that reduces toxic emissions and other types of environmental impacts, that retains products and materials in their highest utility and value at all time. And again, 
The sustainable economy is incenting that system-based approach and is promoting ongoing innovation within the sector. So what's, what, uh, what's the problem right now? Um, and, I, and we haven't really had, a, I don't think, a good discussion about this uh, as part of the day. Um, this is a problem we've all created, um, but over time we've created a far more complex packaging stream with a lot less value attached to it. So you're seeing about a 622, or 620% increase in plastics specifically over the last 40 years. And currently right now in today's economy, generally that material has little value. So what does that mean? There's no pressure in a lot of circumstances to capture that material. There's no incentive in a lot of circumstances to capture uh, that material. For Ontario, we've got, a, we've got a blue box system that's been in place and been in place for, for some time. Because of these new materials coming into this system, we've seen a 30 per, or 30 million, or 30, sorry, $33 million cost pressure on the blue box as a result of the change in materials that we're starting to see in the blue box. That's a direct cost that municipalities in the shared system and, and producers are forced to account for. But it's a big pressure on municipalities as we move forward. And I think as the system evolves, it's an increasing question, I think, for municipalities around how do I manage these continual costs that I'm getting hit with? So there's a specific pressure on municipalities, at least in those jurisdictions, that don't have a full EPR system. And that's problematic. You've got, uh, you've got the issue to some degree that's exacerbated by weak markets. Um, certainly China's uh, uh, national sword has uh, has been a huge hit on, on recycling markets across the world. Uh, the latest uh, numbers I think I saw out today were that by 20, uh, 2030, China's new policy will leave 100, or 111 million tons of plastic material stranded with no market to go to. That's a huge amount of material, and it's because our, our market system doesn't have a way to recapture that value. There's more plastics that are leaking into the environment, and that gets to, again, some of the stuff we've talked about. Because it's got this material, doesn't necessarily have a strong value, it's leaking into our environment as a result of that. And so, you know, this is an, a particular concern for a lot of local governments who end up being the, sort of the end of the pipeline of, of, a, of dealing with this. So you've got materials that are potentially ending up in, in waterways, in lakes, oceans. You've got materials potentially that are ending up moving through your wastewater systems. Um, and you've got materials that are potentially ending up in your landfills or in your, uh, in your MRFs. In Ontario specifically, we've got also got a landfill problem, which, which, which you know, is uh, something that was certainly brought up by the Auditor General about eight years ago. Not a heck of a lot's changed since then. So we've got less capacity in the province to be able to manage these types of materials. So there's a growing crunch happening around how to deal with the problem in front of us. So you've had lots of sort of reaction, I would say, to, uh, to you know, attempt to deal with this. And I think the problem is, and, and I'm probably being unfair to some degree, but I, I'll, I'll go there. I think to some degree, we really haven't responded in a, in a sufficient enough manner to deal with this type of issue. So if you look at sort of the industry re, um, reaction, I think you've seen you know, a focus on education. I, I love education. I think education is great. We have to educate the population. We've got to try to push, push that type of stuff forward. But bluntly, it would be the piece in, in at least the three ministers of the environment that I dealt with that would be that piece to sort of, we don't necessarily have an answer on this, so we're going to push this, this, this message. We've got to train that next generation. And quite frankly, if you look at, at, at our numbers around diversion, it's not working. It's not functioning. You've got work that's happening on an LCA side. And again, LCA, LCA, doing research in this area, really, really important. But again, it's not solving our problem that this material is ending up in our environment. And how do we address that? You've got the push, you know, specifically on the energy bag, bag program of, of, again, trying to extract some type of 
type of uh, value from the material. And I would say to you, listen, I, energy from waste fits in the waste management system, but it's not an, it's not an answer to attempting to deal with the issue that we're, that, that's in front of us. It's, it's, a, it's a stop gap approach, and it does have more value than other things, and it is part of an integrated waste management system, but it's not an answer. And so what you're getting as a result, because there isn't enough uh, of, of a substantial answer coming per se, you've got people flailing. And so, you know, the, the uh, Victoria uh, plastic bag ban, you know, approaches that are being taken on uh, municipalities that are taking on, on polystyrene cups or single-use cups, um, you know, uh, legislators trying to move around, trying to dictate around uh, non-compostable uh, coffee pods. These are all types of reactions to trying to deal with a problem that they've got no real ability to properly deal with on their own. And so this, to me, is leading to a situation where over the next couple of decades, it's just going to be whack-a-mole. There are going to be more and more of programs that the wrong people are trying to move forward to try to deal with an issue they really don't have proper control around, around, around dealing with. So uh, I, I, didn't put a, I didn't put the picture of, uh, of Malcolm Gladwell's book up here. I guess I probably could have done that around the, 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 the tipping point. Um, how do you measure what a tipping point is on an issue? Five minutes, that's not enough time. Uh, I will try to go quickly. I, I don't know how you do it, but I would say to you, there is so much noise out there on this issue, whether it be governments trying to do certain things, whether it be headlines in newspapers, whether it be uh, uh, um, actions that are happening. I certainly measure when a tipping point happens, when my wife, who has no idea what I do for a living, and who rarely reads the news, starts talking to me about an issue. So when she's talking to me about whales that are, that are dying on beaches and birds, it, it's a big issue. And, and I think this blue planet type of phenomenon is really pushing this issue, and it's not going to go away. We have to find a way to deal with it. Uh, typically, when I think about what, how industry reacts to government intervention, uh, I typically think of the sort of Austin Powers type of scene like this, uh, where you get in front of the issue by yelling and screaming and waiting for the thing to roll over top of you. We need to think about how do we get in front? How do you get into the driver's seat? And I really think it's a business question to say, how do I take advantage? How do I, take, how do I make this into an opportunity for me? And I don't necessarily think that that's necessarily happened yet. It's happened around some issues. I would say to you, Loblaws did a great job around being the first one out there to say, you want us to deal with plastic bags? Perfect. I'm going to charge five cents to the consumer. I'm going to start selling a lot more reusable bags, and I'm going to make this into my advantage. And so I think there's opportunities like that where business can say, how do I make this work? So again, I, I put down the goals around, I think, what, what the system is. For me, we got to look at what needs to get done. And, and the first thing to, to do is what is the root problem or problems that we're attempting to deal with. And, and I had a great analogy just the other day, which was, you know, uh, if you're, you're going to go and run your bath up uh, and then go downstairs and make your coffee and you come back upstairs and the bathtub's overflowing with water, what's the first thing you're going to do? Are you going to turn the tap off? Or are you going to grab a mop and try to mop up the water? And I think, you know, when we start thinking about this issue, we much more need to start thinking about what are the root problems, not the symptoms, but the root problems that we're actually trying to, uh, trying to address. How do we get at that? And part of that, once you know what the root issues are, is identifying who are the stakeholders that are in, a, in the best position to affect change in the most efficient manner. And, and I differ from, from Dan, which often happens, uh, around EPR. EPR done properly is not a tax. It's an incentive for somebody to say, you've got to figure out how to deal with this problem. And a lot of time, producers are in the most efficient and effective position to actually deal with some of these issues. So I think mechanisms like that need to be thought through. They're not the only answers, because they certainly don't deal necessarily with the end market side. And the end market side is one of the big issues that needs to get dealt with here. When these materials have value, they'll get collected. I live in Hamilton. 
I put anything on my curb that has any type of metal in it, it's gone in a couple of minutes. When you have materials that have value, they're going to get picked up. So how do we, when we look at plastics, try to create value in those materials so they're pulled back and we've got a system that starts actually working? Um, again, we need to seek mechanisms that, that send outcomes, encourage innovation. Certainly heard lots of that today. Innovation is key. The more government is prescriptive, the less innovative the businesses can be to find the solutions, and so we need to make sure that, that, that that's left open. And again, defining key metrics and defining key definitions, really, really important. We need to know how the heck we're measuring this stuff, and I think there's been lots of presentations today that dealt with that. And we actually have to know what we're actually trying to do. So if it's recycling, what is recycling? You know, is it chemical recycling? Is it just mechanical recycling? Is it re energy recovery? Those types of things need built in. I have my own thoughts on that, but that's probably my limit right now on time. So I will, I will wrap it up and hand it over to Dan. Okay, so if I didn't come to UW to be a chemical engineer, I think I'd be an economist. So I'm gonna ask a question. Is GDP the right statistical measure of the economy in a circular economy? And if not, what is? is Sorry, say it again. Is GDP the... the right? Sorry, is GDP the right statistical measure for the economy? Like, all governments look at GDP output, right? Yep. Yeah. Once we're in a circular economy, what do they look at? Do you want me to take that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's no like start. the definition so, of sustainability again, right? Yeah. So you're getting at the definition of sustainability. So for Canada and the United States, our GDP is here, so therefore our level of sustainability is here. But if you go to Malawi, which I visited, you know, their GDP is here, so therefore their level of sustainability is here. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. So is GDP the proper measure? Right. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. I'll, I'll, <laughs> Somebody else want to take that? Go I'm going well, to give this one quick try, then I'll turn it over to Marco. And, and, and Marco's graph showed that, you know, the more money you earn, the more, it makes sense, right? I, that's why I go to work to earn more money, so I can buy more stuff. And <laughs> as long as we measure success based on GDP and income and stuff, it will be very, very difficult to create a sustainable world. Right. It, it, it was Marco's graph that maybe spurred that. Oh, I mean, so this is the question, and this is why we use PCE, personal consumption expenditures. And this gets to exactly what Norman was saying was, you know, it's the expenditures that a person has. And uh, back to the, you know, moderator's keynote lecture in what is the proper definition and what the proper definition and measure may be right for a region and not right for another region. So. So the short answer to your question is probably not. But unless we have another number or another metric that here in GDP or PCE, at least we have some correlator. And this then helps us to maybe make decisions. But could there be better ones? Perhaps. Thank you. Dan, I agree with you. Circular economy will not work. And two days ago, I put a post on the LinkedIn where I mentioned that there has to be a balance between the linear economy and the circular economy. Now, there's a question to anyone who wants to answer that. We talked about a lot of innovations. Uh, there is one which is uh, at this time, at a very early stage and done by ExxonMobil, what they are doing is they are taking an algae, which is a, which is a single cellular plant, they are using the carbon dioxide, which I'm sure when we are doing any of these processing, uh, a lot can be generated, gentlemen. And like in the plants, uh, I'm talking trees and bushes and all that, gentlemen, using CO2, they convert into sugars or some of other methods with which they can produce ethanol or hydrocarbons. That actually can truly convert into a sort of cyclic economy. The reason is because we all know, whether it's coal, whether it's fossil fuel, one day they will be all over. And Norman, you are right. We are at this moment on the horizontal axis. You showed the last graph. Very soon it is coming to us, gentlemen. And to me, if we have an innovation 
where we can use some of the CO2, besides the energy which we are using by uh, you know, burning this mixed plastic or whatever, convert into any of the chemicals that will truly give us a, an area where we can regenerate very pure chemicals. Any thought about that? I, I mean, you had me a little bit at uh, the circular economy won't work. Uh, I, you know, uh, I, I would probably take offense with that. I, I, I think we can start creating that economy. I think that economy is starting to happen in lots of different ways within, within how we operate. But, it, but it is a, it's a sea change in how we go about doing business. Um, and we need to insert the right uh, incentives into our economic system to, do, to achieve that. And they're not in place right now. So based on the current set of dynamics, yeah, it's not possible. Uh, but I think if the right levers are there, it, it, it is possible. But 100%, the circular economy shouldn't sit on its own. It really does fit with a lot of the other types of concepts that we've talked about today, like sustainable materials management. Um, <clears throat> I'm nominally familiar with that. There, I've got some students that work at ExxonMobil, and we have a couple of colleagues that are on the board of advisors for us. I don't want to say too much, but two things I do want to say. One is we need to think about the scale of usage and the scale of things that we need and materials. And, and that's important. So the scale, not only how much, but the rate, right? This is key. And, you know, as we're hearing, these ideas and concepts and movement in circular economy, sustainable materials, EPR, putting all these pieces together is in the right direction. So I don't think it's really a choice of should we now move toward all kinds of things of algae to make fuels? Sure, we should be moving in that direction, but we cannot forget the buildup of the scale of material that we have now that must be dealt with in a way until we get there. And I think that um, going in those directions are great. We want to make sure that we don't, uh, or we could achieve the scale and balance both but we can't forget what uh, the scale of materials and issues we have now that need to be engaged. No, I agree with you. The reason is because we know the range of materials is, is increasing, and, and you are right, right about that. And sorry about that. I don't want to offend <laughs> that <laughs> circular economy doesn't work. It, it should, but the issue is that, yes, we have to use this mixed plastic, but I'm saying is after processing, if we, the, the CO2 which is being generated, which we are afraid of, we can always have at least one more innovation, and that is converted into fuel or sugar. Sugar means like small yeah. molecules and all yeah. that, you know, which is a truly, again, circular economy, yeah. because now we are generating something out of a greenhouse gas. Yeah, agreed. Any more questions? You, you said there were 75 students in the room. That's what I was told this morning. There were Are there any students in the room? Uh-oh. One? <laughs> One? Two, three. There's no questions from the students. How could this be? <laughs> I'd love to be a student, but I'm kind of past that. Point. <laughs> no, no way. Come on. come on, Barb. You're, no way. You're never too late to go back to school. Look at me. I'm old and I'm back in school. So. <laughs> I may join you. <laughs> Dr. Castelli, I have a, actually um, a question that's kind of granular because you mentioned direct reuse. Pop-up units um, operated by the sanitation department. Anyway, I'm intrigued. Can you, uh, and I'm sorry we're not talking about, I'm not asking this question about that bigger picture, and I'm happy to take it offline. I, Unless I, anybody else wants to know about I, this. I, I, no, I, 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 could, uh, I could briefly, and we could definitely talk offline at the next time, but the direct reuse is the New York City's effort to ensure that material does not get into the waste stream. This is the point. Do not have it get into what we call the refuse stream. So Salvation Army and, um, and Goodwill are the two big ones that we all think of when we donate our material that did not get to the waste stream. What they also do then is say, that's not enough. Let's get universities, church communities, just local communities to stand up something that the local residents, instead of going to try to find these bigger places, Salvation Army Goodwill, 
can go there and sanitation will facilitate moving that around. So if sanitation says, we're gonna help ourselves by not getting that into the refuse stream. If you local community gets all this and gets a ton of material and you need to get it somewhere, we'll, we'll get it there for you. So that's what they so do. So they move it around. Do the, they then um, call the material and remove the things? No, that that's left for the receiver or the donator. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sanitation will not touch it in that regard. We could go more into it because it's actually a large effort. Anything else? Okay, so Norm stole my last line. So thank you, Norm, for doing that. <laughs> but he got exactly the right word out into the market that are into the room that I wanted people to draw that conclusion instead of me telling you, right? He actually said it. He said that if we all disappeared tomorrow, what would the earth do? It would regenerate itself. But we're here on this earth, right? And we want to be here on this earth for a long time. So we have to, we're doing what we need to do to protect ourselves. But we can't just be sustainable in our own actions. What we need to be is we have to start now looking at setting ourselves up to regenerate the earth and ourselves so that we can be around for another number of centuries. Right? I want my granddaughter to grow up to have everything I had. So thank you, Norm. You actually hit the word right on the head. It was nice that you brought it around. So not sustainable anymore, Regenerate, regenerative. So I'd like everybody to thank the speakers that we had today this afternoon. It was a great session. <laughs>